Hello. How's it going, Pete? Cool? Yeah, right, cool. Thanks. thanks, 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 thanks for being here. Um, so let me just give uh, our audience a little background uh, on both of you, and then we'll get started, okay? Right. Uh, for, so for those who are actually joining us today, so Hapsa Aminu is actually bringing a ton of experience with 16 years of teaching English language and literature to young learners. And uh, she is currently an academic coordinator and a teacher mentor. Now, Rashidat, on the other hand, uh, is a passionate teacher coordinator based in Abuja as well. And she's all about learner center pedagogy and championing literacy. And, um, and she runs a mobile library as well, which is awesome. Um, Rashidat uh, even won the Person English Global Teachers Award uh, for Africa and Middle East back in 2000. Uh, so that's 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 quickly uh, um, some some uh, some information about our presenters today. So it's your time to shine now. Feel free to share your wisdom with us. Uh, you can start sharing your slides as well, um, and I'll just um, hope you actually enjoyed this uh, session today. Happy World Teachers Day, everyone! Thank so you. Feel free Thank to you. Share Steve. Your slides. Welcome. All right. Yeah, so um, Hafsa is working on doing that straight away. I just want to use this opportunity to thank all of those that were able to complete the pre-webinar survey. And um, we might be talking about a few of the things that you mentioned in that task. Thank you. Yeah, see, I'm sorry, sharing the screen. Sorry, just a minute. I'm trying to get the... Awesome, awesome. Yeah, Sorry. Um, can you see the screen? Yes, yes, you can see it now. Okay, so welcome right. everyone to today's webinar and happy Teachers Day to every one of us, amazing teachers all over the world. It's so good to have you here. So our topic, as you can see, is planning lessons for 21st century learners. And like Steve said, my name is Hafsa Aminu, and I am working together with Rashida Sadiq. Um, this is the 21st century, and I am sure many of us here today, we are not born in this century. So we need to learn how to plan lessons for those 21st century Generation Z children that we are handling. Um, my years of teaching, my years of interacting with fellow teachers, it's many teachers have confessed to um, finding it difficult, cumbersome to prepare lesson plans generally. Um, they find it time consuming, especially because it was repetitive. Um, I remember when I started teaching over 10 years ago, we used to write our lesson plans on with pen and paper. We had to write it in notebooks and submit. I also remember an aunt back then who used to be a teacher. She would ask me to help her write her lesson plan. She would give me the one she wrote the previous year to rewrite for her. And I would wonder, why are you writing the same thing all over again? And she would say it's because she needs to submit her supervisor needs to mark it, but she never loved to write lesson plans. Um, why is it so? Why do teachers not like to write lesson plans? And what has changed um, since then and now that we are in the first uh, 21st century? These are the things we want to be looking at, but let's quickly have a look at our course content outline. So we will be exploring the concept of lesson planning. We'll be looking at um, the essential skills for 21st century. We will be analyzing learner traits and um, creation of learner-centered plans. We'll look at ways to involve our learners while planning. And finally, we want to identify ways to encourage learners to take ownership of their own learning. So before we move on, let's take a quick poll. I would like you to, to share with us in the chat section 
do you find lesson planning an easy task or are you like some of us who did not find it an easy task? Let's um, share our views in the chat section. Um, we can answer yes with reasons or no with reasons. Um, do you find lesson planning an easy task? Let's do that quickly in one minute and then yeah. we move on. I'm actually seeing a few no's actually uh, in the chat. Um, I've got some comments as well um, 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 about about lesson planning. So there's, there's one uh, from Dian says, uh, it is actually reasonably easy when you follow uh, a set that framework, but still very time consuming. Um, another one saying not that easy, but challenging and interesting. Um, Apricius says that it gives her joy to plan her lesson. And um, yeah, a couple of no's, uh, I think it looks like it's really not, not easy at a task. <laughs> Thank you everyone for your answers. Well, I have good news for you. Um, from my personal um, experience, I believe that because I have lived in both worlds, I have lived in the world, I have taught in the world where I had to write my lesson plans with my pen and um, on paper. And now I plan my lessons using the computer. So I believe that it's become a lot more easy. It's a lot easier now to plan lessons because you're planning it on your computer. You can edit, you can, um, unlike my aunt back then who had to ask me to keep rewriting. All we need to do now is a lesson that I planned last year for a particular class and a particular subject, all I need to do is bring it back again and do some edits. I can, uh, based on the my new learners, based on the new things I have learned, based on advancing technology, I can just tweak the lesson plan a little bit and I am good to go. So um, I believe that lesson planning is a lot um, easier now compared to how it used to be. So what is a lesson plan actually? According to Wikipedia, a lesson plan is a teacher's detailed description of the course of instruction or learning trajectory for a lesson. A daily lesson plan is developed by a teacher to guide class learning. Details will vary depending on the preference of the teacher, on the subject being covered, and the need of the students. Um, this is what Wikipedia has to say about what a lesson plan is. I am certain if I ask um, everyone here, we have our idea of what a lesson plan is. So why do we need to plan lessons? Um, again, I've had some colleagues um, say, why, why do we have to do this all the time? Why can't I just go into the class and, and just teach? After all, I've been teaching for the past 10 years. I've been teaching for the past 20 years. Why do I have to plan lessons again? Let's see some of the reasons why we need to plan our lessons. First, it enhances um, learning, when we get the time to structure our lessons, to plan the lessons ahead of time, it helps to improve students' comprehension. Uh, the, the learners are able to comprehend, to understand better what we are teaching. Um, also, planning ahead engages students. We have the time to capture every child's interest through engaging activities. By planning the lesson ahead of time, we have planned different activities that is going to happen in the classroom. Or like when a lesson is not planned and then we just go into the class and teach and move out of the class. So planning a lesson engages the students better. This is, I think, my favorite reason for planning lessons, time management. When we plan our lessons, we allocate time to each activity that we want to happen in the classroom. Um, for example, five minutes for warm -up activity, 10 minutes for um, watching a video, for example, and 15 minutes for assessment. You know, we, we have the time to plan like that, even though there may be unforeseen circumstances in the classroom, which may affect the timing. But having um, time, planning the time ahead is going to assist us to manage the time a whole lot better. And then assessment alignment. Um, when we plan our lessons, it ensures assessment 
much less in content and provides clear evaluation criteria. You'd agree with me on that. When we have the lesson planned, it's easier to also plan the assessment and then the assessment aligns with the objective of the lesson. Of course, resource um, utilization. When we plan our lesson ahead of time, we are able to gather all of the materials that we need for that lesson. I must confess I've had to, um, on one or two occasions I, that I couldn't plan my lesson ahead of time, it was really funny because I had to run health task Skelter while the lesson was going on to look for materials that I knew was going to assist me and assist my students to understand the concepts bet better. But if the lesson was planned ahead of time, I already know the materials I would need for this lesson and I have gathered them ahead of time. Uh, materials could range from um, um, little things as balloons, um, pens or anything like that. And it could also be something um, like a projector, like the screen video and all of that. So um, planning the lessons helps to gather the materials and have them handy before the lesson starts. So now let's look at the important elements in a lesson plan. The very first thing that most of us put in our lesson plan is uh, the warmer activity or introduction. This, the aim of this is to capture students' attention and provide an overview of what the lesson will cover. First, we want to capture the students' attention. You come into a class and the kids are playing or they just finished another class. We need a grabber, we need a hook, we need to give them something that would make them look forward to what lesson we have for them for that day. So our um, introduction or warm-up activity could be a game. It could even be some slight physical movement, stand up everyone, let's jump up, let's do this or that. And it could also be what um, is called acceleration. I once read a book about how to assist struggling students. And one of the things that the author mentioned that should be done with all learners in the classroom is what he termed acceleration. Um, this is like a warmer activity, but um, a little bit deeper than that because it, because it has to do with going into the lesson proper and anticipating areas of challenges of the learners and then bringing it ahead during the introduction. Um, mentioning it to the students and probably trying to make that simpler even before going into it, the lesson proper. So that by the time you get into the lesson proper, you have already solved an anticipated problem. So we can do any of these as a warmer activity. Another important element in the lesson plan is the objective or learning outcome. And it's important to state clearly at the beginning of the lesson what the students should be able to achieve or learn by the end of that lesson. Um, I always encourage that we put this in a corner of the board so that every child can see, so that we also can see. Um, our objective could be just two or three or a maximum of four in, in a lesson. So it's good to have it up there for them to see and for us to see to always so that we can use it to check ourselves and be sure that we are still on track in, all through the lesson. And then this is featuring again materials and resources. It's another important element in a lesson plan. It's important that we put down all of the materials that we are going to be using for that lesson, be it textbooks, um, other resources, be it technology, I mentioned earlier, we want to project something on the screen for the students, video, uh, games. If we are going to be using games, maybe games involving um, balls, balloons, we need to mention all of these in the lesson plan. And then assessment of prior knowledge. For any lesson, the children are coming, they are not a blank slate. They are coming with some prior knowledge. So we, as a teacher, have to determine what um, the students are, ought to have known before this particular lesson. For example, we want to teach um, 
long division, it is expected that the students already have um, the knowledge of multiplication before they are able to do long division. So this could be a prior knowledge, um, probably in English, you want to teach um, adverbial clauses. Students who are going to be learning adverbial clauses ought to have the knowledge of adverbs. So these are um, examples of prior knowledge. And then during the lesson, we bring this to the fore, we ask the students about their prior knowledge. So this is another important element that should come into our lesson plan. And then presentation, a step-by-step -step outline of activities for the lesson. This is written in steps in the lesson plan. Um, step one, warm activity. Step two, um, assessing prior knowledge. Step three, showing the students um, the video examples. So we need to outline everything we are going to be doing in the lesson step by step up to the last step, which could be um, summary or conclusion of the lesson. And then evaluation, this is another important element. So you need to describe how you assess students' understanding, whether through quizzes, discussions, projects, or other methods. The method that you want to use has to be mentioned um, in the lesson plan. Differentiation. We have different kinds of learners in our classroom. So in our lesson plan, it's important to explain how we will adopt, adapt the lesson for diverse learners, including those with special needs or varying um, abilities. We have um, different kids in the classroom. We have those that are really high flyers. We have those who need some more time to understand the concept. So we need to put all of these um, different types of kids that we have in the classroom into consideration when planning the lesson and plan for them accordingly. And um, conclusion, our lesson has to have a wrap up. We need to summarize the key points of the lesson and connect them to the learning objective. And that's why I mentioned earlier that it's good to have your learning objective up there on the board in a corner so that you can easily refer to it during the summary while summarizing the lesson. And then, of course, homework or follow-up assignment. It's the assigned task of readings for students to reinforce their learning outside of class. Now, there's been a lot of debate on um, homework because parents are divided on this. You have some parents complaining that the homework is too much for their children. And some parents would complain that the kids are not getting enough homework. So we, as the teachers, need to find a balance when giving homework or task. And I would always advise that we give homework that the children are able to do on their own. Uh, many parents would complain that the homework given to the children is not for the children actually, but it is for them, the parents, because they have to do the research, they have to go online, they have to do all of the work. Sometimes the child comes home and complains that I have no idea, I know nothing about the homework. Um, sometimes, the teacher has not even taught what they give to the child as homework. I think we should avoid this as much as possible. Homework is supposed to be um, something to just support what we have taught them in the class, something to just help keep them up, to make them remember and do more of what went on in the classroom, not something new that the child has to grapple with when they get home. And then finally, reflection. Um, as a 21st century teacher, it's good for us to always reflect. This is not for the learners, but for us. We just include a little space in our lesson plan for notes on what worked well and areas where we can improve for future lessons. So this is going to come after the lesson, even though the space is there in the lesson plan, we always include the reflection um, after taking that class. And that would help in the next um, lesson that we are going to be teaching. This list is not exclusive. This is not all that goes into a lesson plan, but these are just the important elements that we cannot do without when planning our lesson. So 
Welcome to the 21st century. Like I mentioned earlier, you all here, including myself, are not 21st century born. But here we are teaching Generation Z children. There is this um, common saying, or is it, um, there's this VP that I like so much that I see a lot online that says, um, um, technology cannot replace teachers, but teachers who use technology will definitely replace those who do not. And I am sure we have seen that playing out now. People go for interviews and one of the questions they are asked is, um, are you computer literate? What skills do you have? Not many people are so interested in our intelligence anymore. They are more in interested in what skills we have, what, um, what are we abreast of technology? Have we evolved with the times? So if we as the teachers do not have these skills, there's no way we want to transfer it to our students. We as the teachers, we as the um, leaders in the classroom need to have the 21st century skills for us to impact, for us to imbibe, for us to include them in our lessons, in our lesson plan. And um, the essential skills of 21st century learning are often referred to as the 21st century skills or the future ready skills. They are all crucial for success in the modern world. So what are these skills? Um, we have four skills essentially for the 21st century. The first one I'll be talking about is critical thinking. Critical thinking is the ability to analyze, evaluate and synthesize information to make informed decisions and solve complex problems. Now, critical thinking is that ability for a person to Think quickly, think out, out of the box. Uh, a situation happens and we are able to think quickly and adapt to the situation. Then um, talk about creativity. Creativity is another important um, 21st century skill. It's the second of the four C's. And this is fostering innovative thinking, originality and the ability to generate new ideas and solutions. It is important to have these two as a 21st century teacher in order to impact it in the 21st century learner. And the third one is communication. Talking about communication, we're talking about both verbal and written communication. Communication is effectively conveying ideas both verbally and in writing and being proficient also in digital media. So now it goes beyond verbal and written. Communication is also the ability to use digital media. We cannot do without that anymore in today's world. And uh, finally, of the four C's is collaboration. That is working cooperatively with others, often in diverse and multicultural teams to achieve a common goal. So these are the four C's of the 21st century. And we have other skills um, such as problem solving, self-directed learning, financial literacy, resilience, global awareness, and leadership. And it's important for both the learner and we, the teachers, to possess all of these skills. And if we find ourselves lacking in any of them, to find ways to to learn them, to go for trainings and just find ways to have them within us so that we can also impact them because our students learn by what they see and not what we say. So we can um, not say that we are teaching these things and we are not these things ourselves. We must have imbibed these, the forces and all of these other skills for us to be able to transfer the skills to our learners. So these skills are seen as essential because they empower individuals to thrive in a rapidly changing world where technology, globalization, and evol evolving societal needs require a broader skill set than traditional education alone can provide. We, we can't say um, crap on this enough. So they are often integrated into modern education frameworks to prepare students for success in various aspects of life, 
including education, careers, and social interactions. It does not end in the classroom alone. It has to do with every aspect of the child's life. Um, I'll be taking the back seat now to allow my colleague Rashida to talk about the learners. Thank you for your attention. All right. Thank you so much, Hafsa. That's been an awesome ride so far. You are an excellent driver. Now the co-pilot is at the helm and I hope it continues to sail smoothly. All right, so um, we'd like to go on to the next slide and we want you to think about the learners. So Hafsa, can you help me with the next slide, please? All right, so what are some of the traits of 21st century learners to your mind? So Hafsa has told us that many of us were not born in this era, we've grown into the era, but we see that there are differences that make it necessary for us to change or to adapt. So what are those traits or characters that you've noticed in your learners? We'd like you to share. <laughs> yes, we are on a flight. We'd like you to share your thoughts through this Menti word cloud. So please, um, Melissa is going to be putting the link in the chats for us. But if you have your phone and you'd like to use that, you can actually use the QR code to um, assess the Menti. So basically, you put your thoughts on some of the traits of the 21st century learner on that page. And we will be sharing the word cloud to see what others have to, to say about that. Okay, Hafsa, so I think I would like to share the menti now. You could uh, pause your sharing. Thank you. All right, so I'm hoping that we've all started putting in our thoughts on that. Okay, I'm seeing some interesting ideas trendy hmm. social media curiosity inquirers yes tech tech yes <laughs> reliant on technology diversity yes we are becoming a global village so that idea of diversity <laughs> spoon feeding hmm. <laughs> interesting hands-on hands-on yep collaboration global yes oh, individualism yes Steve yes yes we just lost you for for two seconds but okay sorry about that I hope I'm back up yes, yes you are. You're okay and I hope you can still see the mentee as it grows yes we do you do. Okay. Okay. Excellent. So I think I'll just wait a few more seconds for a few other people to share their thoughts. Some participants have also been sharing their thoughts in the chat. Um, so we can have both, actually, you uh, can see boredom, uh, projects, technology. So we're getting a, quite a few um, a few um, responses on, on the uh, on the mentimeter. All right, cool. So Rashid, yeah. that um, yes, yes, we also um, we, we lost you again for for for, you know, for a while, but yes, you're back, you're back. Get, yeah, okay, get going. Yes. Okay. So I'll be waiting for Hafsa to start sharing again, okay. but I think um, one of the items on our slides you know, had to do with um, individualism. And you, we do notice, yes, please, the next one. Okay, I'm seeing some people also adding the chats, that's fine. Have said, can we continue? Yes, they're highly inquisitive. Somebody mentioned about curious. They are very inquisitive. Um, my my mom used to say we have generation Y because they are always asking why. Now we need we see that the generation Z are even more inquisitive and 
sometimes they don't even bother to ask why they just go ahead to investigate you know so we need to see how we can incorporate those elements in our lessons that give them the opportunity you know to to see more somebody said they're inquirers we have all of these i think we got the right tricks for them and then they're technology savvy so what can we do to introduce technology in our classrooms um i did see in the chats uh, someone mentioned that what if you are in an area that is not technologically equipped. As teachers, we are always um, problem solvers. And even if your area generally does not have access to technology, if you have access to a smartphone, you can actually help them out. You can give them that energy, that feeling of being part of the wider world. So we can do that. Another thing that they are is that they are socially conscious. So you see, for example, Twitter, now X is always a buzz. Um, you see people, the youth on Instagram, you see them on Snapchat, you see them on Twitter. Yes, you see them everywhere sharing their views, sharing their ideas, right? So they're also quite individualistic. So somebody also put that in the mentee. They want to show their individuality. So while they, they care for social goals and they don't mind weighing in on issues that are trending, they like to be identified for who they are. They like to have a sense of ownership of themselves and a sense of independence. They're also multimedia inclined. Somebody was asking about videos. Yeah, all of this. All right. Sorry, Steve, can you hear me? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Go ahead. So I think I will put off my video. Maybe it will help my bandwidth. So, all right. Thanks. Okay. So um, how do we include all of these traits into our lesson planning? We're talking about multimedia. So not just videos not just um not just audios but how do we include all of it as we plan again and again and of course we said uh, they are born into the technology like even a child that has never really seen technology they seem to have a natural flair for it. So we shouldn't be afraid to introduce it to them, even though maybe at home or in the school, they will not have access. Yes, I see someone talking about interactive games. Those are some of the ways we can, we can um, make sure we take into the consideration their traits. Yes, so I'm gonna continue with some of the things we can do during the lessons. Somebody mentioned interactive games already that will appeal to those traits that we've been talking about. Yeah, the first one. Thank you, Fatima. Okay, so it's important because the learners are so curious, inquisitive, so smart beyond their years that we give them things that are authentic and useful. Yes, I'd like to have that, that point up. So if you give them things that are too... Uh, Apologies, everyone. Um, it's um, ma'am. What am okay. I going to use this for, ma'am? How is this ever going to be useful for me? You know, so you need to be able to give them things that they see as being applicable in their day-to-day -day lives. Next, please. Yes, we talked about multimedia. And um, when we talk about multimedia, it's not always about technology. So we can look at singing, acting, drawing, poetry, writing, oratory, all of that encompasses the concept of multimedia. Um, so if we don't have the technology, we shouldn't just say, oh, there's nothing I can do. Then we need to challenge them. Because if the tasks are too easy, it's gonna be a problem. They're gonna lose interest we already said that they do have short attention spans some of them like to be you know we, we say all these things but 
sometimes it's because we're not challenging them enough. What we're giving them is either too boring or it's too difficult for them. So we have to be at that zone of proximal development and make sure that it's optimally challenging. So for whatever task you want to do, try to make sure On with Google Slides, if you don't want to go to some of the already produced games. Oh dear. So it's important that we try to include some of these. Uh, the gamification is a big part. And in our pre pre webinar task, um, one of the things that people found most difficult to use was gamification. Okay, so I'm gonna try uh, logging in with a different service provider and hope that gets better because I'm seeing a lot of complaints, but um, Hafsa can continue while I try to do that. Hafsa, can you? Sorry? I didn't okay, I said I want, to try to dis I want to try to disconnect and log in with a different service provider. Maybe that will improve my connection. So can you just continue talking a little bit about gamification? Okay. Yes, that sounds like a yes from uh, from Hafsa. So maybe uh, Rashida, you can you can you can uh, actually try a different provider while uh, Hafsa talks about uh, gamification. Okay. All right. So, so I'm 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 okay, actually back? back on a different oh, okay. network. Yeah. So I. Oh, quick Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So go right. ahead. Yeah. So um, gamification is just that concept. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So gamification oh, okay. is a con. Can you hear me? Can you hear me clearly? Yes. 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 Okay. okay. All right. So gamification just means that you try to make your lessons have elements of games. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have a game in every class. So, but you know, something like keeping a leaderboard sometimes is something that would be challenging to the students. They wanna see their name up there. But of course you have to have healthy competition. Just tasks that mean that they get to work. So we have something as simple as a quiz. My, my learners love quizzes. And whenever we are revising towards the end, So Russian, you know, maybe... just something to make the introduce games. Some of them don't even have any point. Yes, please. Oh my goodness. Yes, yes. We we lost you again. Uh, so I was just uh, I just wanted to suggest that you that we turn uh maybe, maybe videos off. Okay. Uh, okay. Wow. Yes. <laughs> Is this worse than before? Okay. So I'm I'm hoping we've gotten an idea of what gamification is. Is. It's about using some of the elements of games, um, challenges, guessing, um, teamwork to drive engagement during the lessons. And we could have online games, we could have physical games in the classroom. Um, technology based, so I did talk about Kahoot. Um, in my class, we don't have so many devices, but I borrowed phones from some other teachers around so that my learners could participate in a Kahoot game. I shared the slides on, um, on the projector, but they didn't have their own personal systems and I was able to borrow a phone. So there's always a way when there's a will. Another thing about learners of the 21st century, because they are socially conscious, they enjoy discussion-based um, lessons. So lessons that have social issues. They, they want to talk about these issues. They want to air their own views. They want their voices to be heard. And then, you know, we can bring it back and have them produce something. So we talked about authentic and relevant. After having these discussions in the classroom, we can create a podcast. We can create um, a Google a website. Oh. 
stuff we can do that they, and of course we talked about their individual and times like i said just in the choice to impute into our lesson plans can i have the next slide please Hafsa, can you hear me yes i can hear you okay thank you all right so um these are just some of the practical ideas that um I share, I use sometimes, and some that I just um, discovered that I could use that would help us involve the learners. So the first one is the KWL charts. And this, these are things that are to be done while you're planning. So even before the lesson, this is to let you know some of the things that the learners want to learn or need to learn. So a KWL chart is just a chart that has a column for what the learners know, um, what the learners want to know, and what they wish you know, they have learned that's um, around that. So you are able to use it to have an idea of their previous knowledge and to have an idea of the challenges that they're having and the things they really want to learn about. You can also create polls. Um, so something as simple as what uh, Hafsa did at the beginning would let us know how many of us actually need to be convinced about how important lesson planning is. We had a lot of no's, 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 um, I don't enjoy it. So I could create a lesson to teach you how to enjoy learning lesson plans from that poll. You know I mean, how to enjoy creating lesson plans. We could, you know, just come up with something to make it better just from the polls. Same thing with surveys, but they're a bit more, um, lengthy or details detailed than the than the polls so for example at the beginning of this the pre-webinar task was a bit of a of a survey and we were able to ask questions around what are the difficulties you face with project-based learning what are the difficulties you faced around uh, um, 21st century learning all right so the next one i have here is question the questions and you get more details about them please Yes, a Mentimeter is also good um, for creating polls. So they have different aspects on it. We could have a poll or we could even use our Wordle. Um, please, can you go back a little bit? Yeah, so another interesting thing that we can do, we talked about individualizing the lesson, we talked about differentiation, is co-planning, co-creating learning pathways with the learners. Can we approach, approach each learner? Hafsa, can you go back, back please? Can okay? we approach each learner to back one? Back? Yes, it's good, it's good. Yeah, it's this one. All right, it's fine. Yeah, here. So can we add, um, approach each learner one after the other to ask them, okay, what areas are you having challenges in? What exactly would you want to learn more in depth because that, that element of differentiation needs to be in there and that element of personalized or individualized learning. So you come up with a plan together with the learner and you come up with a way to achieve it. Okay, these are your gaps. These are the things I suggest. What Which of them do you see as feasible for you? And things like that. And the third one is the learner's needs of analysis, which is a bit also more in depth, but all of these things just help us to gather information that help us to plan lessons that are suited to the learners. So it gives the learners a place in our planning process. All right, can we move on please? Thank you. All right, so next one, please. All right, so now we're just talking about learner agency. How can you get the learners to become more independent? And according to Driver et al, learner agency refers to the feeling of ownership and sense of control that students have over their own learning. We know that 21st century learners are have that sense, they love the sense of independence. They, then it, we hear that 
agentive learners are motivated not only to learn, but also to take responsibility for managing the learning process. So we had someone complain that they like to be spoon fed. We had somebody say they were lazy. And I think it's just like I said, they're not motivated enough. They, they've not been able to take ownership. But if we can give them agency, give them ways to feel in control, they're likely to do better. Can I have the next one, please? Next slide, please. All right, so can you just give me all, all of the points at once because we are running out of time. So first of all, let's try to Um. about the quality of the class or things they'd like to like about it what did you wish i could do better and they they're happy that you you're thinking of them you're not just doing your own thing they then know that you're actually there because of them that you you prioritize them it's really a learner-centered class another beautiful thing that we can do is to give choice so we can use choice boards ask them to choose which topic they want to deal with we can ask them to choose okay do you want to learn outside do you want to use a laptop do you want to use your notebook we can flip the class that also helps if you're able to give them access to some of the material before the lesson they come in already engaged or they already have an idea of what it is and then you can practicalize during the lesson i had already spoken about personal learning, creating, you know, learning pathways together with the learners. What aspects do they want to focus on? Another interesting one that helps is project-based learning. And these are projects that are authentic. They really see the value. They see themselves being productive at the end of the project. And each person in the project has their own role. So nobody would really want to drop the ball. They feel that sense of adding value. And then of course, another important thing that we can do is encourage them to evaluate themselves, to reflect on their actions, to reflect on their learnings. And we can do that through learning journals, learning logs, reflective logs, um, there are name, many names and there are many types, you know, something as simple as what's your emotion when you enter and what's your feeling when you're leaving in the lower classes, you just tell them to choose smiley or frowny face, you know, to evaluate how they thought the lesson was. But in the older classes, you can actually tell them them to reflect um, a bit better. So um, I just have, I think, two samples of what a choice board looks like and a sample reflection log. So Hafsa, can we go to the next one? All right, so this is um, a choice board that I created. And there's one activity that everybody has to do. So it says start with number five. So it's compulsory to do number five. So after, um, the, each learner is to write a summary of the story. in it then I ask them to make any two other choices so if you feel like um, drawing there's one for drawing if you feel like um, creating poetry I think there's one for making connections um, so they can have that choice and there's that sense of agency again coming up and that sense of individualism and then there's this last one is also a reflection journal I created very simple um, what did I learn today so after the, the lesson, Hafsa talked about having your learning objectives up on the board. So you bring them back to reflect. Did they actually learn what they were supposed to learn? And then they can go about also reflecting on the process. How did I learn best? Was it when we were standing? Was it when we were with the TV outside? And then what challenges did I have and how can I overcome them? Now, it depends on you. This can be their personal document or it can be a document that you also go over so that you can see how you can help them to overcome any challenges and how you can make sure that you're leaning towards the way they learn best. So I think um, with that, Hafsa, I believe we've come towards the end. Can you go to the next slide? Yeah, so these are our references and we'd love to appreciate you for being with us. You can go to the final slide where we thank them. All right. Thank you, everyone, Thanks. for listening. Just go ahead. All right. So, <laughs> so I have. So um, like, mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead, Steve. Yes, I just just wanted to yeah, just wanted to thank you for for for, for the session. It's really engaging. 
um, and uh, we should maybe uh, spare some time for, for questions and answers. Um, so I'm happy to so pick some questions from, from, from the q and box, but would you like to uh, maybe uh, pick you know, some questions uh, on your own and then answer them live? Okay, so um, I think I'll just start with some of the questions from um, Hafsa will pick. Okay. Okay, um, Andrew asks, what do you think and what should we do with lesson plans provided by book editors and resources? Yes, I was going to mention as one of the easier ways that lesson planning has come is that um, we now have so many resources online. We also have AI to assist us in planning our lessons. So I feel it is fine to make do with these resources, but we shouldn't lean 100% on them. We should also bring in our own ideas, our own um, originality into our lesson plan while taking advantage of resources that we get um, out, out there. Okay, what are the mistakes the teacher may commit during preparing a lesson plan? Is making a lesson plan lesson for non-native speaker is different from a lesson plan. Okay, I'm not sure I really understand this question. Maybe we'll go back to ease. What do you think about the lesson plan that is included in written textbook? I think I have um, answered that. Is it useful or a waste of time? Um, like I mentioned earlier, it's useful, but we need to uh, make it more original by adding our own ideas to it. Okay, I think most of these questions are the same. I can look at this bit more than yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Yes, questions are. Uh, Okay. Um, I think I think you, you also covered some of these uh, as well, especially the ones around talking about videos. Um, but then I think there's there's um, there's an interest, interesting question in the end. Uh, it's it's about whether you know learner agency means learner autonomy. So do you yes, have? Um, Almost the same thing, learner agency, learner autonomy, they are almost the same. Yes. Awesome, awesome. Line learners to take ownership of their own learning. Okay, cool. someone asked about um, lecturers going into the classes without lesson plan. Well, many lecturers in the universities or higher institutions believe that they are dealing with older learners. Uh, probably that's why they do not go um, prepared with a lesson plan. And um, sometimes they just go in there and give assignments and all of that. We work with younger learners, so we advise that lesson plans are prepared for them. Um, probably someone will talk to the lecturers um, about having plans and lessons. Yeah, I think, I think it's really important to plan no matter what level. And I know that even in Nigeria at a point, some lecturers were forced to go and take their PGDE so that they have better pedagogical methods. Awesome, awesome. Now, now there's another question. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I, I see a question about um, public schools and having so many classes. If um, the students, if there is SS1, A, B, C, D, and, and so on, these are the same level of learners and you're teaching the same subject. So I believe that one lesson plan suffices for all of the um, classes. And remember, we talked about differentiation. So you can have your differentiation in your lesson plan and use it accordingly with um, all of these classes you're going into in the public schools. All right. And the lesson summary or note be infused in the lesson plan. Yes, definitely. You can have your summary in the lesson plan. Uh, yeah, also... and I, I, I did see a question earlier asking if they're the same thing, lesson plans and lesson notes. I don't know how to say if you want oh, to talk okay. to them. Um, no, I didn't answer that. Lesson plans and lesson notes are two different things. Um, a lesson plan is what we've talked about um, and all of the components of the lesson plan. A lesson note is just a note um, that may go into the notebooks of the students that you are teaching. So we can have the lesson notes in the lesson plan if we like. And we may have it as a separate document. Yeah, what about videos as homework? I give them for homework because parents complain, English subtitles and along with language. Yeah, it's fine to give um, videos. That not, may not necessarily be a homework. It could be like um, what my colleague said about flipped classroom. If I understand the question correctly, you can ask them to watch a video. And then when they come to class, you discuss the video. That's fine. 
create create um, maybe um, just put the, the question around um, you know uh, which is better between daily lesson plan and weekly and lesson plan. I don't plan. know if we have more time to answer more questions. It's almost well. Yes, yes, yes. Um, just, 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 Sorry? just maybe one more, maybe one more, and then um, okay, um, and there's there's just one you know around uh, whether you know uh you think daily lesson plan um uh or weekly lesson plan you know which one is actually better in your opinion? Okay, daily lesson by, plan. Um, or weekly lesson plan. Lesson plan. Well, it depends on you really for us in my school for example we prepare lessons weekly and um, so the weekly lesson plan may be for two classes or three classes or just a class so but we prepare it um, weekly and then in the steps we differentiate which is going to come first which is coming second and on and on like that and that helps for the first lesson, the second lesson, the third lesson. So it's actually easier to prepare uh, a weekly lesson plan than a daily lesson plan if you're going to be having more than one class in, in a week for a subject. Oh. All right. Thanks, Bo. Thanks uh, uh, for uh, being able to answer some of the questions in the chat. Uh, but we actually running out of time now. And um, we just want to thank you for, uh, for your presentation again. But also thank you, thank you for uh, the amazing crew behind the scenes. Um, I would like to invite maybe Joe to uh, maybe connect uh, okay. for for some final words. Thanks, thanks, Joe. Okay. Thank so you. So, do you mind do you mind stopping uh, the slides? Start, uh, you actually still sharing Sorry, the slides. Would you mind? I said, would you mind stopping uh, the slide sharing? Please? Oh, okay, all right. Thanks. Right. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks, Steve. Hafsa, Rashida. Thank you. That was so, so interesting. We were really interested in what you had to say. So thank you for keeping going, even though the connection um, was lost. But we, we did get a lot of that. And that was so, so interesting and inspiring. So thank you both. Um, Thank you, Steve, as well, for hosting. And since this is actually our last session of the World Teachers' Day event, uh, I just wanted to say a few thank you. So thanks, first of all, to everyone who has attended these last three days. You've been a fantastic audience. Um, loads of participants participation and um, lots of sharing of ideas and a really positive atmosphere so it's so great to have you as part of this international community of English teachers thank you um, also thank you to Melissa well she's here for me I don't know if she's for everybody <laughs> but Melissa has done um, an incredible job it's a huge task to bring all of this together um, basically a year's work that gets more and more intense as time goes on but thank you so much to melissa uh thank you to paul braddock sure. well. <laughs> paul's not here right now but he's done also a huge amount of work uh, behind the scenes and in preparation and also helping to make sure that this event is as success as successful as it can be so thank you to paul and also thanks to all of our presenters, hosts and moderators. There's too many to say by name, but you know who you are uh, and we love you. So thank you to everybody. Happy World Teachers Day. Exactly. Happy World Teachers Happy Day, everybody. Teachers Day. <laughs> and we'll see you soon, hopefully, in one of our mini events. Perhaps there's more webinars to come. Take care, everybody. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Goodbye. Bye.